Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Our uh, faithful few are here. <laughs> now we're missing some of our regular contributors, you know, uh, Karen Badorf and the Cases and the Davenport. So some of you have to step up now and <laughs> chime in with us. But as far as prayer requests, let's remember the team that's up there in New York. That's the Davenport, the uh, Karen Case, and Karen Badler. Sounds like they're staying busy and having a good ministry, so let's be praying for them. I'm sure it's hot up there in New York City. <laughs> in fact, the Northeast is, is hotter than we are, I believe. So, uh, man. So next week, Beverly and I are going down to Florida to get some relief. From the heat. <laughs> Uh, and I checked, they do have AC, so we're good. Uh, but yeah, our AC is working here, so it should be a pleasant time together. Any other prayer requests we want to remember? Yeah. My prayer work for Angie Kermit and Carol. It's um, you know, it's just a trying time. And then also my target in the curve from trying time with that too. So the situation itself has gotten better. But God gave me a plan and I executed it. And then my time is done. She executed the plan. Well, she took the plan. 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 She took because of all the, you know, about it, radiation and all that, you know, small pain and everything. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff there. So, um, anyway, if you think it tests with July, another MRI or July with this, um, personally, that tumor has not gone back, I hope. It won't hold me back, but I'm looking for another place to live, too. So. Okay, good. If you keep them in your prayers, thank you. Yeah. I know Rex and Sandy and your family will be traveling. They're coming in. They're coming tomorrow. If everything goes well. Yeah, it's a big. Just for those that were praying, um, our friend Floyd passed away late Tuesday night. So I just pray for his family. His yep. wife is, you know, grieving. 57 years to marriage. Yeah. So. Yep. Okay. All right. Try to remember these through the week. Um, these things that we've shared. <clears throat> I want to bring you to your mind. But... All right. Let's go ahead and start. Father, we thank you for the uh, freedom we have to meet together. We thank you that you've given us a, a comfortable place to meet, and that we can meet without fear of persecution directly. We just don't want to take that for granted. We pray your blessing as we meet this morning. We pray that you would speak to us through your word and teach us and prepare us, Lord, for the week ahead, we pray. Lord, you've heard the requests and you know what they are in great detail. And we do pray for these requests. Lord, some is for sickness and some is for um, bereavement and those some physical needs as far as a vehicle being taken care of. And, we just pray that you would answer each request and you would work in the lives of uh, each of these. Give us wisdom to do your will. And Lord, we depend on you for answers to prayer, but you also expect us to do our part. So we pray you'd give us the uh, wisdom and discretion to serve you faithfully in the days ahead. We pray especially for the Saul family that would be traveling from Haiti. We ask for your provision and protection for them. And we pray for the team up there in New York, and we ask that you would bless their ministry. Please give them health and strength and safety. 
And we pray your blessing on all the aspects of our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Samuel 23. <clears throat> so before we start, yes. I'm sorry, I have a crazy report. I just told you about how the president of El Salvador cleaned it up and now it's a, a Christian country. Wow. And uh, okay. covered all the corruption. You know, the missions were really persecuted in the water. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He testified that he, um, he knew it was a spiritual battle. He had his security cabinet and him praying. And he told Tucker Carlson when he asked him, how did you do it? He said, well, the official thing is we, ch we went after the games and we took the phases. But the unofficial is that it was a miracle. Yeah. And we got to the end yeah. And we knew it was a spiritual battle. And we knew once we got the spiritual battle won, then the physical would come into play. Yeah. Praise the Lord. God can work in many ways through many people. That's good. Okay, 1 Samuel 23. Let me ask you a question, thinking back, and I hate to make you think, but um, what? tell me, what do you think, what do you, what do you think of the emotional and spiritual state of Saul at this point? What's going on with Saul? <laughs> Betsy's shaking her head. Right, he's not in a good place, right? Spiritually, certainly not, and we're going to talk about that more. Emotionally, we're going to see that today. He, emotionally, he's not in a good state. He's got, he's a bit distracted. All right, what about David? What about David's emotional and spiritual state? I mean, he's going through a tough time, right? He's on the run. Has that helped or hurt his spiritual condition? It helped it, right? As often does, right? Often trouble brings us closer to God, and we see in David, David leaning on the Lord, right? And we're, that's going to really come out in today's lesson, the differences, the contrast between Saul and where he is and his relationship with the Lord and David. So we'll see that as we go, and then we'll sum it up at the end. But 1 Samuel 23, I've got a map up there just to remind us where we are. And all that happens today is going to be in this area, and, and this is all where the Philistines are. So you see the, the proximity of what's going on. And David is in the wilderness right? Let's just look at chapter 22 and read the last three verses there of 22. Remember, they were in Nob, and they fled, and then Saul came to Nob, and he destroyed the city because he feels like the priests betrayed him. It says in verse 20, now one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Ab Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priests. So David said to Abiathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me, do not fear, for he who seeks my life seeks your life, but with me you shall be safe. So David's in the wilderness. He's joined by Abiathar, who is the son of Himelech, who Saul murdered along with all the other priests. And really Abiathar is the beginning of David's priestly staff. So he's kind of the first holy man that's working with David. Now we said Saul is kind of spiraling downward. He's obsessed with David. All he's got on his mind is getting David. Remember, he's the king. He's the king of a nation, and all he can think about is getting David. Uh, and then also remember that both Saul and David are military men, and they both have spies and informants. Okay, And that plays a role in all that's going on. Remember, there's no cell phones, no social media here. So their, their info comes from their spies. And we'll see that both sides have spies. So that's why it seems like they both know what the other's doing, because they have this network of spies and informants. So let's look at the first five verses of 23. <clears throat> then they told David, they, probably his spies, told David, saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and they are robbing the threshing floors. Now, Keilah, you want to look at the uh, map here, just so we know where Keilah is. If you look at uh, right above Hebron there is Keilah. So Keilah is right on the border of the Philistine territory. The line's not there, but it's just to the west of Keilah is, uh, is Philistia. Okay, 
So look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Okay, so while in hiding, David is informed of the Philistines harassing the people of Keilah. And Keilah is about 10 miles from where David's camp is at this time about 15 miles southwest of Bethlehem near the Philistine border. Now, the big question is, where's Saul? I mean, you know, no, nothing's mentioned about Saul. Apparently, he's not interested or able to help the people of Keilah. He's not that far away, but David hears from it, and he says, ooh, you know, he, he's running from Saul, but he's still a loyal uh, uh, soldier for Israel. So he says, should I go and help these people? So he inquires of the Lord. And what does God say? Go. He says, go. But then David's men push back, right? Now, we were told in 22 that he had, there are 400 men. At this point, if you look at verse 13, there are 600 men. So evidently, David's ranks are swelling. And at this point, there are 600 men. And they push back. They, and what is their reasoning? Well, they say, they say, look, we're afraid here in Judah because we're running from Saul. And you want us to go near the Philistine border and fight the Philistines, that's going to be a two-front war, right? We're going to have people in front and behind. They said, I don't know about this. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like the situation Israel finds itself in now. You know, they're fighting Hamas to the south and now Hezbollah in the north. And that's the concern. This, this little country is going to have two fronts to the war. Uh, and, you know, that's a concern. So... David, sensitive to their concerns, inquires of the Lord again. He says, Lord, are you sure you want us to go? And what does God say? He says, yes, and, and he assures them of success. Right, so he says, yes, go, and I will give you the Philistines. So he, uh, he said, uh, I'll deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David and his men go, and they have a great victory. And what are we told about, in addition to victory, they also get what? The spoil, right? So they take the livestock of the Philistines. Why would that be important? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a food supply. So God, in this way, provides for David's army through the livestock of the Philistines. So interesting. And we're going to talk about God's provision. So... Again, no mention of Saul in any of this. So they go to Keilah, they, they save it, they push back the Philistines, have a great victory. Then in verse 6, we're told, now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, okay, we're told about that with Abiathar, David said, come to me, I'll help you. So Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. Okay, what's an ephod? An ephod was a part of the priestly garb. If you read back in the uh, Torah there, it talked about the, the, the wardrobe of the priest. And one of them was the ephod. It was a vest or an apron that they wore. A couple pictures here. Of course, these are artists' conceptions. Here it's more of a vest. It's the colorful vest above the blue robe. And here's another depiction of an ephod. And on the ephod then would be the breastplate. And then you'd, they had the little the, the stones on each shoulder, which had the names of the of the tribes of Israel. But the the priestly ephod symbolized the authority of the priesthood, specifically in connection to to when they wanted to determine God's will. That they would wear the ephod, and that was kind of the showing that priestly authority to go to God to determine His will. So we're told that. Uh, Abiathar brings an ephod with him when he comes to David. Okay, so let's keep reading verse 7. And Saul was told, his spies, that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. 
Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. So Saul gets word that David is in Keilah. Go back to our map so you can see that. <clears throat> now, he has no apparent interest in the security situation. Okay, here he is. He was told that the Philistines were harassing Keilah, but all, all Saul hears is that David's there. So he says, let's go get him. His only concern was that he thought he had an opportunity to get David. This was a city that had walls and gates. And he said, ah, if David is in there, we can trap him. And we can set up a siege and we'll have him. So he calls his army together to go and get David. Now notice, Saul has lost all military interest. <laughs> he has no concern for what this means with their fight against the Philistines. It's all about getting David. He's greatly distracted. Okay, verse 9. So now it goes the other way. Now, when David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. And David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So David and, and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. Okay, so David hears of Saul's intent. And he calls for the ephod and inquires again of the Lord, probably through Abiathar, I mean, yeah, Abiathar, the priest. Now, what was his main concern? What was David's concern? Well, that and, but he was concerned for the people of Keilah, right? Now, what, what were they remembering? You remember the city of Nob, last chapter? And Saul came, what did he do to the city? Look at verse 19 of 22. It said, also Nob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword. But, so he didn't just kill the priests. He destroyed the city, killed everybody he could in the city. That's what David thought, well, Saul's going to do the same thing to Keilah. So he inquires of the Lord. He says, got two questions. He said, "Will is Saul coming? And are the people going to hand me over? Again, he wasn't saying that that would be a bad thing. He just said, this is a real possibility. Um, he realized that they may surrender David to save the city. Notice his concern for the people of Keilah, unlike Saul. <laughs> Saul seemed to have no concern for his people. So David and the 600 men flee, and when Saul hears that, he turns back. The opportunity is gone. Again, you'd think he'd say, well, at least I'll go visit the city and see how they're doing. <laughs> but no. So, up, oh, David's gone. Forget it. All right. Verse 14, and David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. So David flees to the wilderness of Ziph, which is a desolate, hilly, and wooded area between Hebron and the Dead Sea. So if you look, you see Hebron there and the, and the Salt Sea. So that's the wilderness of Ziph. You see Ziph down to the south. So the wilderness extends toward the Salt Sea there. It was an ideal place for hiding out because of it was hilly and wooded. And how often does it say Saul sought to find and capture David? Daily. <laughs> He's obsessed. I mean, this is his only mission in life now is to get David. You see, it's almost becoming a, a, a mental problem. You know, that's all he could think of. But it says God did not allow it. And David, we're told, fully realizes the danger. Now, he realized this is life and death. Saul wants me dead, and he is intent. Um, and but God did not allow it. So David's in a pickle, right? I mean, he is, he realizes this, the danger but then we're, to, we're told in verse 16 and 18, it's not all but the news is bad. 
So verse 16 and 18 to 18. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. Interesting. Da Saul is seeking daily to get David, can't find him. But Jonathan comes, he finds him. And it says that he came and strengthened his hand in God, and he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his own house. Okay, so Jonathan visits David. He's able to find him without any trouble. What was the sole purpose of this visit? In one word. Begins with an E. Encouragement. Encouragement. It says there in verse um, uh, 16, to strengthen his hand in God. The NIV says he helped him find strength in God. It was an encouragement. I mean, look at the things he said. He said, number one, Saul will not find you. you number two, you will be king. Number three, I will be loyal to you, although certainly that was intent, but he never got a chance because we find out he dies before David becomes king. And the last thing he says is that Saul, my father Saul, knows that. We're going to come back to that at the end, but that's significant. And then it, it says that they made another covenant. What? How many covenants is this? This is number three, In chapter 18, chapter 20. Now he makes another covenant. It really is not a new covenant. They renewed the covenant. Basically, they said, I still, you know, we still are pledging loyalty to each other. What a great blessing for Jonathan to come to David. I mean, think of the timing here. David's on the run, probably discouraged, and God sends Jonathan. What an encouragement. What a blessing. And I thought, wow. Can you? And I thought, you know, there have been times in my life that... God sent to Jonathan just to encourage it. And I thought, wow, what a great ministry. And I thought it was nice when a Jonathan came to me, but how many times have I been a Jonathan and gone just to encourage somebody? I mean, Jonathan had nothing to gain here. I mean, he was putting him, his own life at risk. Remember, Saul, in, in Saul's state, who knows what he would have done to Jonathan had he known that he was visiting his enemy. But Jonathan goes just to encourage David. So, wow, what a blessing. So that, that's what you ought to think about is how can I be a Jonathan? Interestingly, this is the last meeting between David and Jonathan, and it's the last mention of Jonathan until his death at the end of the, of the book. So we have that encouragement in the middle of all this trouble. And then we come to verse 19, back to trouble. Then the Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah. Remember, they're in the wilderness of Ziph. So the Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hakala, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. Please go and find out for sure and see the place where his hideout is and who has seen him there, for I am told he is very crafty. <laughs> see, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with certainty, and I will go with you. And it shall be, if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. Now, this is a little bit humorous in my mind. <laughs> okay, so the Ziphites come to Saul to rat out David. What do you think is their motivation? Favor? Maybe fear? Right? They want favor with Saul because, again, they're thinking of what happened in Nob. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Saul's erratic behavior, they're like, who knows what he'll do? We better make the first move. Let's get in with Saul, tell him David's here, maybe he'll leave us alone and we'll survive. Certainly understandable. Then verse 21, what does Saul do? He plays the victim card, right? Reminds us of chapter 22, verse 8. Remember when he says, All of you have conspired against me, and there's no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, 
And there is not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me. I think uh, Steve Case called it uh, Saul's pity party. Yeah. <laughs> and here we see the same thing. He plays the victim card. Now, what's going on with Saul? Okay, as a physician, I'm trying to diagnose Saul's mental condition. <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh, is this pure manipulation? Which it could be. He's just he's playing this card thinking maybe this they'll tell me and help me. Or maybe he's just delusional. Maybe he really thinks he's a victim here. Poor me and his outlook is warped. Sometimes we get so far from God and following him that our, our outlook is, is warped. And he really thinks he's a victim. Poor me. Yes, Pete. During uh, times when we're obsessed with something, you can't sleep. Yeah. You don't sleep. You don't, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, he's not in a good place. <laughs> Emotionally, spiritually. And his character is quickly deteriorating. He is, he is going from an effective leader to an emotional mess, basically. And we're, we're seeing it unfold you know, right here. Now, why is, so he plays the victim. Now, you know, we all have had times in our lives where we may have been the victim. I'm not discounting that. But why is it wrong for a Christian to always be playing the victim? Right? But what is it really, what, what does it boil down to when we are playing the victim? Lack of faith? Maybe selfishness? I mean, really, when you're playing the victim, you're saying, all eyes on me, poor me. And again, I'm not discounting that some people are victimized. Uh, but when we dwell on that, right, the focus is here, not there. And that's exactly the, the wrong, that's why it's wrong to dwell on your victimness, okay? Now, again, sometimes God in his sovereignty lets us be victimized, but we need to, as Christians, we need to get over that and say, you know, I can still serve God even in my victimness. I don't know if that's a word, but... You have to be blessed even so blessed are you. I mean, really, his, even his speech is getting so... And fatigue... Or is he starting to lose it? But you notice also, what does he ask for from the people of Ziph? He wants specifics, right? He's already wasted time going after David and Keilah. Now he says, tell me exactly where he is. Make sure he's there because I don't want to waste any time. And we're, if he's there, I'll find him. Right, right. But he's also learning, even though he's demented and deluded, he's learning to appreciate the qualities of his enemy. What does he say about David in verse 22? I feel, I hear that he's very crafty. <laughs> Perhaps the other word would be slippery. He says, you know, this David is proving to be a, a worthwhile opponent. I can't seem to catch him. So again, that adds to his frustration. Okay, verse 24. So they arose and went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David. So again, somebody told David. Therefore, he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. So who told him? The spies, maybe the Ziphites were feeling guilty. So he goes down to the wilderness of Maon, which is 10 miles southeast of Hebron, about three miles away from where he was. So the, he moves about three miles. Of course, Saul hears that he's there, and he pursues him. Remember, David's got 600 men now, so he can't move too stealthily. So he moves, and then Saul's told, and Saul says, okay, fine, let's go there and get him. Verse 26. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. So it's not looking good for David. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines, so they called that place the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. So Saul advances on David, and he's close to surrounding him. Militarily, he's got the advantage. 
But then Saul gets a message that the Philistines have once again invaded Israel. Do you think this was maybe God orchestrating this? <laughs> right. And apparently this time it's not just a border town that's being, it, that they've actually come into the main part of Israel. And apparently this is more serious than Keilah. And even in Saul's state, he, this can't be ignored. He's going to lose his homeland. So he leaves the pursuit of David. And then we're told that David escapes to go to En Gedi. If you look on the map there, there's En Gedi. Down there, right by the Salt Sea. And En Gedi is, there's an oasis there. So it's almost like David goes there now for a little R&R. &R. Okay, it's, it's a comfortable place. It's a much needed rest. Again, God's provision for David. Now, I want you to flip over to Psalm 54. I told you last time I taught that several of the Psalms, possibly up to about 20 of them, were written either during or about this time in David's life. So it's very significant. Uh, and David wrote Psalm 54. The introduction says, to the chief musician with stringed instruments, a contemplation of David when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, is David not hiding with us? Okay, so he's He's thinking about the time that the Ziphites ratted him out, and he knew Saul was going to come after him. And let's, let's just read that psalm together. So this is David's thoughts. Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Wow. And, you know, once you know his situation, those words have a little more substance to him because he, he's speaking them from his heart. He's crying out to God. But he's not in desperation, right? He, he cries out, but then he says, Lord, you're my helper. He's basically casting all his care on him. And he knows that God will deliver. So what a, what a great uh, understanding about how David is doing. Now, I want you to think about um, God's blessings to David. You know, we, we contrasted Saul and David. And we're going to do that a little bit more here, but... Look at the God's blessings to David just in this passage. First off, there was that assurance. Remember, he, he inquired a second time about Keilah, and God not only said, go, but I will give you the victory. God gives the assurance. Then God gives provision, right? The Philistines were beat. They took their livestock. They've got meat. Then he gives them direction. He tells him what to do while he's in Keilah. Then he gives him encouragement through sending Jonathan. Then he gives him security and deliverance while he's in the wilderness of Ziph. And finally, he gives him rest at En Gedi. But wow, look at, all, look at the way God is blessing David because David is seeking him, as opposed to Saul. <laughs> all Saul is getting is mentally, emotionally spiraling and nothing but frustration. Now, what is, all right, so that's the story that we're covering today. Any thoughts on that? We got, we'll make some applications here, but let's see. Maria, did you, did you raise your hand? I get the impression that Saul was really Could be. Yeah. 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 That's interesting because we're going to build on that in here in just a minute, but yes. It's kind of comical in my mind, like, 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 like,
about actions and what they did and where David is, you know, on that side of the mountain with God, you okay. know, with God. Good. Great lead into my next point. So, who knows what a type is in Scripture? What, what, what is a type? When you say someone is a type. Forerunner. Okay, forerunner. What's that? Right. It's someone who symbolizes or represents someone else. So, like, for instance, everyone understands that David is a type of Christ, especially later in his life when he becomes king. So, David is a picture Imperfect, but a picture of what Christ is going to be as far as reigning as king. Okay, let's go back to verse 17. We talked about when Jonathan was there. What did he say about his father there at the end of 17? Even my father Saul knows that. Uh, what wickedness to know the plan of God, but to still fight against it. And that's exactly what you were saying. Is Saul is so far gone that he... Even he knows, he knows that he's not going to remain king. He knows that his family isn't going to stay in. And yet he's still, he bent on destroying David. What's, what, is da what is Saul's main sin? Going back, what was his main sin? Pride, right? It was pride which led to disobedience and hate. Okay. Now, talking about types, think about it. Saul was greatly privileged, as you mentioned. He was tall. He was good-looking. He was, he was greatly blessed by God. He was put in a high place. He was made the king. And yet his pride caused him to disobey, to hate. He was rejected by God. <laughs> and now, even though he knows his end, he continues to oppose God. That's a type of Satan. I thought just as David is a type of Christ, Saul is really a little bit of a type of Satan. He was in a privileged position. God was blessing him, but he let his pride destroy that relationship. He was rejected, right? Satan was kicked out of heaven. And even now, Satan, do you think Satan knows his end? Absolutely. He, he knows the Bible better than we do. And he probably knows more. <laughs> well, he does know more because he's been a around a lot longer than we have. So he knows the history, all the prophecies. He knows that he his end is bad, and yet he's doing all he can to fight against God and his people. But wow, that puts into perspective what we're up against as believers. Satan is ruthless, just like, and just like Saul, you, I mean, there's no end to what Saul might do, or there's no end to what Satan might do. That's how the Psalms apply when we say, we're surrounded by enemies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so we, we literally cry out for the same Exactly. Yeah. That's why the Psalms are such a powerful help when you're in trouble or when you're oppressed by Satan because David was facing the same thing. Yeah. And the Bible tells us that Satan is like a roaring lion walking about seeking who he may devour. I mean, it's just like Saul tramping through looking for David and just want to destroy him. One of the things I recently learned maybe in the last year is that if he makes my feet like hind feet, a hind clearly swings almost vertically to a rock. Hmm. And you have to have the exact point of his foot in a little yeah. heaven. Huh. Like if you look at a hind, he looks like he's standing yeah. at this mountain, yeah. like literally like this. Huh. And so below a mountain line, that are waiting for one of them to fall. And he's holding on to the rock. Yes. Very good. Very good picture. Yeah. Nice. You raise your hand? Um, yeah, I know I know he said um, you look at look at David and he had a conversation with God at the time. Oh yeah. Everything that he did, wherever you go, whatever. And then you look at Saul. Well, he even he would go to Samuel and say, Pray to your God for me. Yeah, he, he didn't have that relationship. Exactly. Exactly. This really worked if you thought that this guy could be blessed in the action. You know, blessed are you, the Lord, because you have to be blessed. And so he, right. he really honestly thought that God would bless him in his pursuit of David mm -hmm. and that the disciples would be intent as a blessing to yeah. God. Right. 
that, that just shows you the, the warped outlook of an unregenerate mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. Or did he go through a Beathar the priest with the ephod each time, or was it private? Yeah, we, we're not told. But the point is, right, he went to the Lord. And, and good lead up again. Now, in the beginning of the chapter, when David went to the Lord and said, should I go to Keilah? And David said, go. Then his men said, wait a minute, we don't like this situation. So, question, was it wrong for David to inquire again of the Lord? No. Why not? Right. I agree. What was his concern for? His concern was his men, right? He was respecting the concern of the men. David was probably ready to go, and he said, let's go. But the men said, whoa, whoa, David, wait a minute. Do you realize we're going to have them front and behind? We're going to be in a bad spot. So David said, well, you got a good point. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go to the Lord again. He goes to the Lord again. And rather than chastising David, God gives further assurance. That's why we don't think it was wrong, because David said, God, are you sure you want us to go? And God said, not only did he say go, he said, this time he said, I, will, I guarantee you you're going to win, because that's what the men needed. The men needed that assurance. I don't know that David did, but the men needed that assurance that, yes, God is going to give us the victory. And that tells us, you know, God really knows what we need in our human weakness. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we don't need a whole lot of insurance. We just, like you said, sometimes we're leaning a certain way. We say, God, you want us to do this? And we feel like he's saying, yeah, go. Okay, go. Other times we're like, are you really sure, God? <laughs> said, said I've, got, I've got some doubts here. I've got some hesitations. And then God says, go, and I'm going to make sure you win. So he gives that assurance. Yes. Right. Yeah, I think that's why David was not, I wasn't wrong for David. David was saying, okay, I need my men to feel good about this too. So he said, goes to the Lord again. And now, well, again, whether it was audible, whether the men were part of that, we don't know. But God says, go and you will win. And then, then there's no indication that anybody complained about that. They said, let's go. And what a wonderful thing that God not only directs us, but he knows, he knows what we need. He knows how much encouragement. He knows if we need a Jonathan to come and encourage us, and he'll send a Jonathan. Yeah, isn't that something that God knows, and, and he does all things well? So what a, what a blessing and what a contrast between Saul and David. I mean, if you look at these two characters, which one do you want to be? <laughs> do you want to be in a tight relationship with God where you can talk to him about everything and God blesses and makes sure that you have what you need when you need it? Think of the torment and the frustration of Saul. I mean, terrible way to live. Yes? Or the home period of process was. Back when they had the ephod, it had a certain array of stones that would pick up frequencies, and they could actually, through frequencies, actually hear better the word of God. Mm. God definitely used the priest to indicate his will to the people, and that was part of all the priestly garb, was the, the God's, the turn, the, knowing God's will. Yes? That's kind of what I promised, and I will never leave you once it takes you. And that um, some of my favorite for me is that he directs his steps to the uh, the right. So, so um, in a hard situation, just in you know, a hard situation, like I'll pray that you would really shut the door, that you can shut open the door, and you can open, and guide my feet, guide my heart. And um, he says, uh, you'll hear a voice behind me telling you this is the way to walk. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not a very audible voice, right. but... Oh, yeah, and that's how we should pray. I mean, that's how David prayed. David prayed that, you know, so... Good. Well, good examples. All right, good comments. We're out of time, but... All right, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for the story of David and Saul, and Lord, just how you made it so clear that your 
your blessing was upon David because he was your child. And Lord, we pray that you, we would like try to be more like David, that we come to you with our troubles and our trials, and then we trust you to deliver. Lord, please help us to also be willing to be used by you to encourage others, just like Jonathan did. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us in this coming week to be a help to others. Bless uh, this uh, week. Bless the uh, time together today. May the fellowship be sweet. And may we all be encouraged by being together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I just